Good evening. I'm going to read the English Standard Version of Philippians 3, 3 through 14. Is that correct, Sam? Yep. Okay, thank you. So Philippians 3, 3 through 14. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Good evening, everyone. Good to be here with you all. Um... Recently, we were having a class uh, on Mondays, and we had a really good discussion, and uh, I'm just kind of explaining what, what my thoughts were going into the sermon and developing it. But we were discussing in Luke chapter 7 there, you have uh, the woman who went in where Jesus was visiting with the Pharisee, and she began to wash Jesus' feet with, uh, with, with her tears and with her hair. And we began to briefly discuss the courage that was required in order for this woman to kind of let down her barriers and exhibit this humble disposition that she had. Not not just humility before the Pharisee, but more importantly, a humility before God, before the Son of or before Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And so I was thinking about this, and one conclusion I came to as I was contemplating this woman's courage to be humble is that if there's one thing, and there's a lot of things that a Christian is not called to be, but there's one thing in particular that a Christian just cannot be, and that's a coward, fearful. There is no room for cowardice in the kingdom of God. It takes great courage to be a Christian. And that's really what I was thinking of, and I began... This turned into an exposition of Philippians chapter 3 because I believe that Paul is speaking to several areas and several things that a Christian needs to do that I believe require courage. They're not small things. They're things that require courage. It takes courage to let go. There are things that we need to let go of and it requires courage to do that. It takes courage to let go of pride. In Philippians chapter 3, going back to the scripture reading, Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 3, Paul says, For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul tells us that we aren't to put confidence in our flesh. As people were stressing the circumcision, they're saying you need to be circumcised in order to be part of the kingdom of God. But Paul says we don't put any confidence in the flesh. We worship God according to the Spirit of God. And furthermore, he says, if anybody has the right to boast, what about me? Look at the things I did. I was a Jew. I was born to the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised the eighth day. According to the law of Pharisee, I persecuted Christians. He says, as to the law, which, or he says, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But he says these things don't matter. There's no reason for me to be proud of these things. These are things that I have to let go of. Why? Because he's counted them all lost for the sake of Christ, because of the surpassing worth of Christ. Paul says we need to let go of our pride. There's nothing you or I can do in and of ourselves that will make us worthy before God. We can't do it on our own. And it takes courage to admit that, a willingness to admit that, especially in a society that we're living in today that really touts pride and taking pride in who you are is the most important thing. They say, be proud of who you are. Don't change for anyone or anything. You're perfect just how you are. And yet we read God's word. Paul says we don't put confidence in the flesh. Jesus tells us we need to be poor in spirit. Everywhere we read, we see how imperfect we are. And as we read, we see that we have to be convicted and we need to change. But we're never going to get to that point unless we drop the pride and are willing to admit it. And this is something that we all understand. We could go to several verses. Pride comes before the fall. We know how dangerous pride is and how it can get in the way of so much. But why is it still something that we all cling to? We need to let it go. It takes courage to say, you know what? Maybe... I shouldn't be proud of the way that I'm living my life. Maybe a change does need to be made. It takes courage to say, I'm wrong. Something we all had to do when we obeyed the gospel. You're confessing, I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. Something hopefully we all continue to do as Bible students. Clinging to certain doctrine and seeing God's word. I'm wrong. It takes courage to admit that you can't do it on your own, that I can't do it on my own, but that you need help, that you need the blood of Christ, that you need the help of the brethren. It takes courage to admit that, and it takes courage to to let go of the pride in order to admit that. But we need to do it. We need to let go of our pride so that we can gain what? So we can gain Christ. That's what Paul says. I don't put confidence in the flesh. I don't worry about my days as a Hebrew. I count all these things as loss. They're rubbish compared to what I have with Christ. That's Paul letting go of pride. Furthermore, we need to be willing to let go of the past. In Philippians, again, in chapter 3, and as you drop down to verse 13, Paul is talking about about obtaining the resurrection and really eternal life is really what I believe he's getting at here. He says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Paul says the one thing that he's obtained is that he needs to forget about what lies behind. 
Again, there was an immediate application there for those who were trying to integrate Jewish practices into Christianity. As he even started off this whole passage talking about circumcision, and I, and I get that. But even that, as we're looking at that, what it seems to come down to, and I often think of the Jews letting go of what lies behind of the Jewish practices, these were things that they were familiar with, that made them feel comfortable. They they couldn't conceptualize the idea of of no longer making these yearly sacrifices and keeping these rituals and, and, and keeping the Sabbath. Letting go of these things made them uncomfortable. They didn't understand that Jesus' sacrifice was good for all time. It made them uncomfortable to think that the only thing that you need to do to enter the kingdom of God is is to have faith in him and be baptized into the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. When you are raised up out of that water, you are part of the kingdom of God. That made them uncomfortable. It wasn't what they were familiar with. And it was a hindrance to them. They needed to let go and forget about what lies behind. And that applies just as well to us today. When we become a Christian, that's a big change when you make that decision to become a Christian. You know, you think about yourself when you first became a Christian and then you look 10 years after that. There should be a marked difference. But in order to see that difference, it means that you might have to give up some things that make you comfortable, that feel familiar. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that you had before you became a Christian and you're finding now it's detrimental to your faith. It's hard to remain faithful and this person is a negative influence in your life. But the relationship makes you comfortable. It's what's familiar. But if it's detrimental to our faith, it's something that we need to let go of for God. This is just one example. Or perhaps you're obeying the gospel and you're coming from a different background, a different denomination. And there are some practices that you're keeping that you're involved in and it's hard to let those go. It's what's familiar. It's what makes you feel good. You walk in here and we're singing a cappella, and that's really uncomfortable. You think, whoa, people are going to hear me sing? There's no band to distract others from my voice? That can be uncomfortable. But it's what God's word teaches. We have to be willing to let go of the familiar. Let go of what lies behind. But the application is even greater than that. Talking about what lies behind. We all took a different route that led us to where we are this evening. Worshiping God in spirit and truth, or at least to the best of our ability, that is is what we are trying our best to do. Worship God in spirit and truth with other saints who have obeyed the gospel. We all took a different route. There were different sins that we each committed that caused us to look in the mirror one day and say, I need the blood of Christ. We each have mistakes that we regret Things we did that we wish we hadn't. Let me ask, is there anyone here that wishes they could go back in time and and do things differently, given the chance? I've never understood how some people can say, because you hear people ask this question, they say, well, I have regrets and there's things that I should have done differently, but I wouldn't change a thing because it's made me who I am today. You know, I get that, but I kind of have to roll my eyes at it. (laughs) There's things I would do different. Do you think Paul wished that he had done things differently? As in Acts chapter 20, 22 and verse 20, he, he reflects back to the martyrdom of Stephen. And he talks about how he stood by. Not only did he stood by, but he stood by approving, holding the coats of the men who did it. The garments of the men who did it. 
Do you think Paul wish he had done things differently? These are things that can cripple us. Paul had the blood of Christians on his hands. Maybe it's something different for you. Maybe you struggle with alcoholism and that's caused pain in other people's lives and that's led to mistakes that you regret. Drug addiction, similar thing. Maybe you struggle with sexual immorality and it's again caused you to make decisions that have brought pain into other people's lives. These are things, again, that can cripple us as we reflect back on them. When I say let go of the past, understand I don't expect one to lose all memory and regret over their actions. We could take it to to an unhealthy extreme. But what I'm saying is we have to have the courage to move on and keep living. The courage to not let our mistakes cripple our faith and understand that if we make the changes, God's grace is sufficient. We have to have the courage to trust in that. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 62? In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus says, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And I understand this is in the context of somebody who wanted to follow Jesus, and they said, let me go say goodbye to my family first. But this was Jesus' response, wasn't it? But this applies to all areas of life, to all instances where we might look back and take our eyes off of Christ. Anybody who puts their hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And every time I read that verse, you know, one thing I've noticed, a big difference between Washington State and California is not everybody has lawns, grass lawns. Uh, Back home, we had a front lawn and and a backyard. And it was kind of a rite of passage. You know, you get to young adulthood and you finally get to mow the grass. And we had, again, a front yard and a backyard and it was an electric push mower. And the goal that dad always gave us is he wanted as straight lines as possible. The wheels leave these lines in the grass, and he wants those lines to be as straight as possible. And my brothers and I, we're always in a competition over this, and we're always forever telling each other, you know, your lines are really crooked there. (laughs) But one thing I noticed growing up is I'm trying to mow in a straight line. I'd be pushing the lawnmower, and sometimes I'd look back to see if it's straight, and then I look forward and I notice I'm veering off the path. Jesus says, no one who puts their hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because you can't cut a straight line. You can't toe the line. You can't can't keep your focus on what God has laid out before you, the task before you. You become distracted. And we fall by the wayside. But these are all things that, that we have control of, aren't they? We're, con- we're looking at all these things, and, th- and we have control over all these things. But maybe it's not a matter of sin or choice that's, that's causing you to look back. Maybe it's something you have no control over. Maybe there's something that has caused you a great deal of pain. Something that has become a primary focus of your life. Something that has taken precedence before God because you're constantly dwelling on it. It takes up every thought of every moment. It makes it hard to wake up in the morning. These two are times to rely on God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, and I'm just going to reference it, but he says that God... He refers to him as the God of all comfort. We need to remember that our God is the God of all comfort. He can comfort us from our sins, our mistakes, our troubles, our difficulties, our griefs. But we got to go to him to get that. We got to be willing to turn to him, to rely on him in order to receive that. 
Sometimes we have to let go so we can grab hold of something better. And I'm talking about God. I'm talking about Christ. I have a passage, 1 Timothy 6, 19, but I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves there. I'm going to forgo that passage. And I just want to talk about laying hold on eternal life. Because that's the reason that we let go of all these things. That's the reason we let go of our past and let go of our pride. Because we're trying to lay hold of what? Eternal life. Again, going back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. And I already mentioned... Well, actually, we'll just back up to verse 11 to give context here. He says, In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. What is that that Paul is talking about for which Christ laid hold of him? Why did Christ come to this earth, live a perfect life, and die for us. It was so that, yes, we can be cleansed of our sins, but have eternal life. We're told in Romans 6.23 that the free gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. So if we're going to lay hold of eternal life, we have to obtain grace. That's grace. It takes grace in order to lay hold of eternal life. And through Christ, we're able to do that. We are told in Titus verse two or chapter 2 and verse 11, we're told that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. We're left without an excuse, aren't we? I don't believe that before you were born, God chose individually each person here who's going to receive grace and who isn't. It's appeared to all. The offer is for all. And there's not a single thing that anybody in this room has done that God's grace can't cover if you're willing to turn to him. It appeared to all. Why? Because Christ appeared to man. And when Christ came, we're told in John chapter 1 and verse 14 that Christ was full of grace and truth. And we're told in verse 17 that the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. This is why grace is available to all. Because Christ appeared to man and he was full of grace and truth. Therefore, if we have Christ in our lives, then we also have grace. And to have Christ on your side is to have grace on your side. And that's the side I want to be on. Therefore, when we lay hold of Christ and we have that relationship with Christ... We are free from the sting of death, which we know is sin. And in Romans chapter 6, in verse 14, we're told that sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Through Jesus Christ, we have this grace offered to us to the extent that our sins no longer master are, are a master over us. We no longer have to worry about the death that our sin brought about because of grace through Jesus Christ. So obviously we need grace if we're going to lay hold of eternal life. But in addition to that, we also need righteousness which obviously is obtained through grace. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, going back to our scripture reading once again. Paul talks about counting all things rubbish so that he may gain Christ. It may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. 
Our goal is to be found righteous in Christ. That's the only way we're going to be found righteous, is in Christ. We understand that it isn't on the basis of our works, but it's a righteousness that we are blessed with through the blood of Christ when we take advantage of that. But let me tell you, it's not just about obeying the gospel. It's a continued pursuit. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 10. There's so many different things that we get caught up with in this world. And we forget about what really matters. And one of those big things is money, isn't it? And Paul writes to Timothy, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which, which, which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy is a Christian. He was cleansed of all unrighteousness when he confessed before God that he was a sinner. When he obeyed the gospel by being baptized. And yet Paul writes to him to pursue righteousness. Righteousness should be a never-ending, lifelong pursuit for each of us. It takes courage to stop caring about riches and what people think about our money or about our social status or whatever it is, and instead care about what God thinks and what he considers to be good and right. Timothy was told to flee those things and pursue what? Righteousness. But finally, if we're talking about grace and talking about righteousness, we can't talk about those things without talking about faith. We know that in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 8 that we're told, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And furthermore, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, talking about righteousness. And we already read that, but I just want to call your attention to the fact that Paul says, It's not a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of what? Of faith. If we are going to obtain the grace and righteousness offered to us, we need to have faith. And you know what? It takes courage to have faith. Because it's not about having faith in ourselves. That's what we so often are are doing. That's, I feel I do that all the time. I want to control every aspect of my life. And it can be real uncomfortable to say, you know what, God, please take care of this. That's uncomfortable. But we got to do it if we want to lay hold of eternal life. As Paul already mentioned, we saw that we are not a to be a people who depend on the flesh to obtain eternal life. We instead put our faith in he who John says was full of grace and truth, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you're struggling with faith, you feel that you do not have enough faith right now. We know the memory verse, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or God, some translations say. If you lack faith in your life, the way that you build up that faith is through the Word of God, through studying the Word of God, applying it to your life, challenging yourself. There are, throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, four opportunities to hear the Word of God and to build our faith. 
We have to take advantage of those opportunities if, if we're lacking faith, especially. Because we see just how important faith is. It's integral. We have to have it. And we can't afford to sacrifice it for anything. This is what's required if we want to lay hold of eternal life. And yes, it, it, in order to lay hold of eternal life, it means letting go of some things. And you may be asking yourself, how does it take courage to pursue grace, righteousness, and faith? The reason it takes courage to do that is because all those things come back to putting your trust in Christ and denying yourself. It comes back to not loving your life. This current life, this current world, that's what I'm talking about. But instead putting your trust in and prioritizing eternity. Christ said, whoever loves his life will lose it. It takes courage to stop worrying about all the material things of this world and just to put our focus in Christ. But you know what it reminds me of? I've told the story before about the, the time I went surfing by myself and I almost drowned uh, in the state of Oregon. I don't know if you all recall that or not. I went, I went surfing by myself. Uh, probably wasn't in the best state of mind to be doing that as far as where I was at in life. And uh, I was riptide and I almost drowned. I'd never been surfing before. Uh, <laughs> but there's a part two to that story. Because uh, I've, never, I've never described how I got out of that predicament. And the thing about it is that I was on my surfboard and I was swimming as hard as I could to get out of this riptide. And I was just staying in the same spot. Finally, since it was in a cove, I worked my way to the outer edge. And there were some rocks right there, but I was still trying to paddle because I didn't want to lose the board. And I was worried about getting off the board because the leash had really torn up Velcro and I thought, that thing's going to get ripped right off my ankle. I'm going to lose that board. But eventually I made the decision that if I'm going to live, I've got to stop caring about this stupid $100 soft top surfboard and grab onto that rock. And so that's what I did. And you're probably thinking to yourself, Sam, that didn't require courage. That required common sense. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. That's the point. Because from our worldview, all these things that I'm talking about require courage. But when we're looking at things from the scope of eternity... It's common sense. It's a no-brainer. At some point, we need to choose to stop caring about the things, about the surfboard, about the things that just don't matter, and grab onto the rock. And that's Jesus Christ. We have to be willing to do that. But the story wasn't over there. We have to have the courage to press on. Let me tell you, it wasn't easy getting back to the shore. I grabbed onto that rock. But I wasn't out of the woods yet. I was still in the water, and I had to drag myself basically to shore. My hands were bloody. They were raw by the time I got back to the beach. We need to have the courage to press on to what lies ahead. As I was looking at that, that shore... Trying to get there. Can't worry about the surfboard. I got to leave that behind. I got to press on. Philippians chapter 3, going back to the scripture reading once again. Verse 13. It says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
I don't want to overemphasize this point, but we can't be a people who live in the past. We have to be a people who live in the moment. And maybe you got, that causes pause, because Christians don't often talk about living in the moment. But we have to be ready to face what lies in front of us right now. The challenges that we're faced with right now. The opportunities we have to serve God right now. Understand, there's a difference. I'm not saying that we should live for the moment. But we certainly need to live in the moment. But we live for God always. And we live for eternity always as we press on. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 6? I think I have verse 44. It's actually verse 34. There is no 44. That was a typo. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. Jesus says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We need to just worry about today. If we are looking forward at all the, all the things, wondering how it's going to pan out, we may be looking past opportunities that we have to serve God right now. And we may not see them at all if we're too busy looking at what's going on behind us. We need to live right now and seize the moment to serve God. And this is how we can live for God. This is how we can press on. We, we press on and we keep our eyes on the prize. Again, to, to reemphasize that verse in Philippians 3 and verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul talks similarly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Just uh, this last week, I was over at the Barkas' house. I think it was last week, or was it over a week now? I can't remember. But we're watching the Michigan versus Ohio State game, and Michigan got, got killed. Sorry to bring that up <laughs> for the Michigan fans out there. But one thing that Clint said as he was watching it is he said, you know what, Michigan, they're playing not to lose, and they should be playing to win. There's no room for timidity in the kingdom of God. We have to run in a way where we're, our aim is to win the prize of eternal life instead of running not to lose. The runner keeps his eyes ahead at all times. He's always looking forward. He's always focused on the finish line. And to look back for even a moment could be the difference between winning and losing. Look, it can be healthy to reflect on the past at times, to see what God has done for you, to learn from our mistakes, but it can also become detrimental to one's faith if we dwell on it for too long. The best thing we can do is learn from our mistakes, learn from the difficulties, and use them to make us better, as opposed to allowing them to make us worse. I'm a firm believer. When it comes to, to difficult circumstances of life, especially those uh, of which we aren't in just because of our sin, but times in our life that we have no control over, I'm a firm believer that that there are two different individuals that have two different plans for us in those circumstances. The devil has his plan, and God has his. And it's all a matter of where we're going to put our faith. Are we going to put our faith in ourselves, in things, in relationships, or are we going to put our faith in God? What it comes down to is staying committed. The cross-reference I have there is James chapter 5 and verse 11. This is just what popped in my mind. I thought about Job when it comes to staying committed. James chapter 5 and verse 11, James writes, We count those blessed who endured. 
You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Let me ask, did Job handle his situation perfectly? No. Then again, who here would handle that situation perfectly if that was the situation we were in, the position that we were in? But one thing that is clear to me, and what James talks about here is his endurance, his patience. His commitment to God was unwavering. Even as his wife told him to curse God and die. Sure, there were moments when he challenged God, almost to the effect that he wished to have a debate with God to plead his innocence. There were, there were times where he cried out asking the very same question that we're all so tempted to ask when we're going through difficulties, which is what? Why? But he did not compromise his commitment towards God. He hung on. Sometimes that's what it's about. Pressing on, getting through, hanging on. And if we do that, we see the end of Job's story. We recall what happened to that, to, to, to Job. We know that 14 children, if I recall, they died. But at the end of all that, again, he got seven sons and seven daughters once again. And all the possessions that he had lost were returned to him twofold. God blessed him twofold. That should be a lesson to us. That should be a reason to endure. That if we stay committed to God, He's going to bless us. He's going to take care of us in the end. And it may not always manifest itself physically. But we know we have a guarantee in eternal life. We must have the courage to let go of the things that weigh us down, that get in the way of serving God. So we can lay hold of eternal life. And once we do that, we have to continue to have the courage to persevere, to press on, to get through. If we do that, one day we'll end up spending eternity with Jesus Christ. And that's the goal. That's what we're all aiming for. So if you're here this evening and life isn't, isn't going your way, you know, one thing my dad always told me, when life wasn't going my way, at the end of the day, I'm a Christian, I get to go to heaven. That's the comforting thing that I always had. If you're outside of Christ, I want, I want you to be able to say the same thing. And you have an opportunity to say the same thing this evening if you're willing to obey the gospel. And if you've been struggling spiritually in any area of life, uh, please come forward and, and while, we, while we stand and sing the song.